The mind is a muscle that needs to consistently be worked on. I mean, you've heard about, you've heard us talk about it so many times on this podcast from vision casting and breaking the barriers, the, the mental barriers, the ceilings in your mind, um, to giving it the recovery and the nurturing and the massage that it needs. You need to consistently work on your mind. It, it is uh, the most powerful thing and it can also be the most limiting thing. And we're live. Great. Wes, Antoine, welcome on in. Gentlemen, I'm, I'm incredibly excited about this conversation, you know, to, to peel back the, the layers of our process, right? We had this, this pre-interview call on Friday with the two of you, uh, with our team. And in that conversation, I think so many, so many interesting, so many intriguing things about your story came to light that, that I'm excited to dive more into today. The, the place that I want to start, <clears throat> you, you mentioned in that, that first conversation, this, this tagline that you, you kind of abide by, which is prosper with purpose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going to leave it there. Talk to me, talk to me about <laughs> what that means and what that represents to the two of you in your story. Yeah. Um, so for me, it actually, it actually first started a long time ago in church in just, um, this notion that it was, it's bigger than, uh, just us. And it, in the middle of this multiple crises that we were going through in the spring. So take the pandemic, uh, and take May and June when we were at the height of the social justice issues, um, we were seeing each other maybe once a week, uh, Max, and this this thought that for for us, our career, our firm is bigger than just us. It's bigger than just, we have to have a purpose. Our prosperity, our success is not just for us. It's for the next generation. It's for women and minorities in the industry. And so we started thinking about, you know, what does that mean for us? And at the same time, we've been doing this for, a long time is talking to clients uh, and we were getting text messages and emails from clients from the same period that their prosperity is not just for them. So how do we get them to think bigger about not just their legacy? What do they want to do for the next generation? But for here and now, you know, how can they make an impact in, you know, what we're going through on a daily basis, uh, be it giving to charities and nonprofits that are uh, obviously near and dear to their heart, but also the social justice issues that we're going through. And it seemed to be a theme that resonated with both what we're trying to accomplish, but also what our clients are trying to accomplish. If I want you to prosper, but I want you to do it with purpose. I want you to have meaning behind everything that you're doing. Um, and so that a dollar is not just for a dollar's sake, but it's for, uh, it's, it's for your legacy and everything that, that, that you can impact with that dollar. And, and in some ways that was going through that process and coming up with this, this idea of prosper with purpose was sort of a transformation that the two of you even went through, right? You, you were telling me a little bit about the story of um, shifting your focus from, you know, I, I'm trying to support myself, I'm trying to support my family to mm-hmm. maybe there's something bigger at play here and I can have a bigger impact. Tell me more about that transformation. Yeah, I mean, that piece is interesting. Um, like we shared with you last time, both of us come from uh, middle income, low income kind of backgrounds. And studies have shown that people with less have a tendency to give more, just on a high level. Um, So I think it just started bleeding through for me and Wes as we became more successful and our personal lives became uh, more financially stable. Naturally, we wanted to start giving back. And that started with small pieces of uh, charitable contributions, uh, Big Brother, Big Sister, which we're both uh, members of. I'm still an active member. Kind of crazy to think that my little is now an 18 year old teenager driving with tattoos, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's awesome to see. And like Wes said, um, we sat down and determined that we needed to do it on a greater scale. And so we had to think about, okay, well, how can we do this? I can't buy someone a house, um, but we can let people know in a very humble way that you don't need to do something totally out of this world, like be an entertainer, an athlete to be successful. Let people see that 
normal people from backgrounds like they are can be exceedingly successful. And secondly, uh, start giving back time, talent, and resources in a greater way. And that is beginning to develop itself in the form of a BTA scholarship that we want to, uh, that we're going to roll out next year, 2021, that will help uh, minority underprivileged children get into uh, help with their, their tuition at community colleges and local schools. Um, and those are, those are kind of the two big things. It started off small and it's becoming bigger. The Prosper with Purpose tagline um, is becoming more powerful because the conversations that we have with our friends and clients are deeply embedded in authenticity. And clearly it's such a powerful part of our worlds that we start talking to other folks about legacy and legacy and legacy. And, you know, uh, it, it kind of bled through to them and they started talking about it and thinking about it and asking us how they could help. So yeah, we're trying to turn go, this pebble into a rock. If, if you go back to um, even today, but if you look at any my marginalized or, or underprivileged community, um, be it women, be it black people, be it a Asians, Indians, it for you to advance, it takes a village. It, it really takes a village. And I think that um, not everybody may feel this way, but I know Antoine and I do. Um, with whatever gifts we have been given, uh, it is incumbent upon us to try to enact change in any way that we can. And I think that's the mission that it, that it stems from is, uh, I, we didn't just get this to just have it. Uh, we need mm -hmm. to make it. We need. We need to make a difference in whatever way that we can, because it's going to take people like us that look like us that think like us, uh, in order to make it better for the next. Yeah, you you talk about this idea of of uh, it, it it takes a village. Um, explain explain more of, of what that that means. Um, I mean, <laughs> there's there's so many. That's, <laughs> There's so many big things. And so when you think of, of, of the systemic issues that we deal with, um, you can, you know, the prison pipeline or the school districts and how they're funded, uh, the, equi the social equity issues that we deal with both in the workplace and in, in, in education, we need more of us to help us to change the statistics, right? I, I think back, I mean, some of this dawned on me last year, but it, last year in particular, but um, there was, uh, but I, I never had to think about it before last year. And it's very, very strange. Um, there was a rapper that was killed uh, that we listened to, um, you know, frequently. And, and um, this was March of 2019. And it happened on a Sunday. And I was eating with my family and I went and dropped them off and I picked up Antoine and we went and had a drink and we cried and this, that, and the other. And I share that because in the midst of this, I thought to myself, I, all of the things that we go through culturally, I've never actually had to go through alone in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's so many people that do. My wife was giving uh, her black employees the day off or asking them if they wanted the day off after this happened. And I just, I was like, oh, they don't have an Antoine. They don't have someone that they're, they're mourning alone. Um, and, uh, and so that, that, those are some of the barriers to entry that people don't think about, that you have to be constantly code switching and hiding your emotions and things that you're going through that I've never had. I've been, I need to recognize my own privilege uh, and that I exactly. had someone side by side that was going through the exact same things that I was going through. So until you change those figures, it, it's not going to be a comfortable situation, whether at work or at school. And so you need more of us. And that's what I mean by it takes a bit. We got to change it from within. And I'll even add to that. It's not like we just sit around crying when rappers die. This specific rapper was Nipsey Hussle. And this whole message was about uh, owning uh, your company, owning your name, owning your brand, because you are the most powerful agent of your message. And if you're giving away a lot of that, uh, that equity or all of that equity in some cases, um, what do you, how, how can you build a legacy? So you see, it, it all kind of comes full circle. So when Nipsey was killed, that was, that was a really sad day for us, but it was also a catalyst in helping us to get to specifically where we are today, 
owning the building that we're moving our office into, owning the company, having partnerships, of course, for compliance and so on, but owning the company uh, ourselves so that we can build something that is incredibly valuable that we could pass on to the kids or sell and change the, change the trajectory of our family even more. Um, so, you know, I wanted to touch on, on, on that specific piece, but Wes's take, takes a village comment is so real. I mean, there are only so many Kobe's in the world, right? That can go alone and have the alpha male, I'm gonna do this thing regardless. Most people need a team. And we have one or two African-American friends in this, in this industry. And one or two African-American friends that are as, as successful as we are and more. Um, so to have a, a counterpart that you can sit down with, grow with, learn with, commiserate, cry, uh, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. But it's not like it was just me and Wes. We also built amazing relationships with folks of all races um, that, that contributed to the village that helped us succeed. And gosh, we could go on forever on this. I could go back to you know, when I first immigrated to the US and the village that it took to even build the confidence, the finances and so on to get to this level. Uh, I won't belabor it, but it's it's a very powerful statement. And so then when when does it start to occur? Because you talk about, you know, you talk about in this industry and, and the lack of minority representation in this industry in particular. Um, but, but even expanding outside <clears throat> of that, when, you know, um, the two of you, what's so powerful about your stories, as you mentioned, you know, you, you are, you're paving the way in this industry, you're paving the way for minorities, you're paving the way um, for black business owners in, in many different ways. When, when do you start to make that mental shift of, um, you know, recognizing that, that the vision that you can create for yourself, for your life, for the impact that you can have, when does that start to become bigger and greater and what is that process like because i can imagine that you can be met with a lot of a lot of doubts right a lot of doubters mm -hmm. a lot of people who are saying hey that that path <clears throat> that path hasn't been proven before uh that path mm -hmm. hasn't been paved before so talk me through that process of of some of the things that you had to overcome to even set your vision as big as you have i'll touch on that a little bit and let wes expand um you talk about it takes a village. Early on in our careers, we started vision casting, writing our one, three, five, 10 year visions. And this was uh, really accentuated by an intro to Ben Newman, who's still a great friend and mentor of ours. And Wes was the one who uh, made that introduction. But, you know, I think back to my first vision in 2008. And there, there's so many limits in your head, right? And people to this day, it's, it's very hard to break the barriers that are in your own mind, but it's the most powerful tool you have. Um, but back in the day, 2007, 2008, as I was writing my, my first vision, it's like, I want this $350,000 house and an Audi and a 43 inch TV. At those times, those things were frankly unattainable. Um, but through doing this for the last decade plus, and really believing in yourself and understanding that there, is, there are really no limits. We've made our visions huge and scary because we know that if we get, if we have a, a vision that's at hundred and we get to 79, we have done pretty, pretty well, All right? So I'll let Wes add on to that a little bit since he was the cat at the starter. Keep your hand below the <laughs> I saw your glass. hand popping up behind. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's it's funny. Um, I will say that uh, going back to that this notion of giving back, I feel like my success or vision has been a byproduct of the people that have just been around me. Um, and so, even before, uh, like in college, for example. Um, and pe you know, I've done some probably some some crazy things that most people that I didn't consider crazy, but that most people might say are crazy. Like um, going into my when I started at Northwestern, six months after I started a, a commission only internship, uh, I I bought this condo in downtown, and 
Uh, Antoine tried to talk me out of it. My parents didn't lend me any money that they, did, <laughs> that they didn't have. Uh, and so, you know, I, I scrambled up the funds to put a, you know, 3% down payment and did it. Um, and I noticed in that, in that process of, I had these bills to pay that it made me stay in the office and grind until it was done. Mm -hmm. And so you, you work out this memory, this muscle memory of when I take risks, it seems to work out. Um, so like a year, six months into being full time, I hired my first staff person that people didn't have. And it was like, you build this muscle memory of when I take risks, it seems to work out. Um, and I had a bunch of people in my corner from our first managing director in particular, Rick Abel, uh, that, that believed in me or challenged me to think bigger and do these vision statements and cast a big vision. And, and it seems to, it seems to work out. He used to joke, so I had a two bedroom condo um, and he and his wife, who was our sort of office, office director at the time, told me I should put a crib in there in the second bedroom and think about the family, <laughs> and think about the family that I was going to have and who I was going to be you know, providing for. Um, and so uh, the reason that I think that we are so generous is I didn't just do this stuff on my own at mm -hmm. all. Uh, I mm -hmm. am a byproduct of the people that put their, you know, helped me cast these visions or surrounded me with successful people. Um, and I, I just stood on the shoulders. So whatever people were doing yep. that were 10 years my senior, I was trying to match that at a young age. I was trying to have this type of and this level of production uh, at a young age. And, uh, and knowing that it was, that it was attainable. Um, and so that, that, you know, as you, as you get more and more into the career and you get more and more successful, uh, the vision does get bigger because it's, it's an amazing career uh, and it enables you to do a lot. And so, um, yeah, that, that is, it was I mean, we, we purely- We were really fortunate to grow, grow up in our career with a group of folks that felt like family. I had my managing partner give me 20 bucks to put gas in my car when I was like 24, 25, making no money in this industry. I have spent nights, weeks with coworkers. I have been in several coworkers' weddings. I've been, uh, I've officiated a coworkers' wedding. We had some amazing counterparts with our former firm that we still talk to and love to this day. And, and to Wes's point earlier, a lot of them were senior in the industry. And so we not only saw their lifestyles, but had a deep understanding of what it took to get there. So the standing so what, on the shoulders of Giants Commons is really good. Yeah, how uh, you talk about like this, <clears throat> this family of, of people who, who help propel both of you in this industry what goes into because I to me just uh, everything that I in all of our conversations that we've had up to this point you know and, and I think it's it's no it's also by no accident that the two of you are longtime great friends and now business yeah. partners but um, what what contributed to creating that family atmosphere is there something that we can take away that you know we should be searching for or that uh, were there certain traits that that the two of you just had or that you brought you know, dissect for us a little bit what went into creating that family atmosphere where where there was a true team that helped propel each other personally and professionally. Determination, desire, authenticity. Passion. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's just, passion. you look at, at 37, almost 38 year old me and you look back at 28 year old me and the traits are still there. Hunger, resilience, um, friendliness. We're in an industry where our former firm had one of the highest retention rates and it was still only like 11%. So it really, those are the traits that it takes. The people above you or before you, in my opinion, need to see that you have a true desire to attain these things. You don't just, don't just talk about it. They hear window dressing from nine out of 10 people and only one I, in our industry kind of pushes forward. We're an anomaly. Yeah. And to, to the determination point, you know, some of these, uh, some of our former uh, and, and our best friends, I used to mentor in the business as well. And so Antoine's point about determination, if you're surrounding yourself 
with people that have a common vision. It may look different a little bit, but a common vision and you are, it's a big vision. You have to be determined to get there. And so when you talk about a family, you're like in a, for lack of a better term, you're in the war room together, right? You are trying to accomplish similar things and you're like minded. That is a team and that is a family. And, you know, these sorts of things bleed through via osmosis. Um, And so you do the things that are abnormal, meaning you, you stay late and practice your language. You stay late and dial. There's nothing that can get in your, you are like, here's my roadblocks. Here's how I'm going to get through it. And we're all doing this together. Um, And just, that's what you get when you have a great team. Wes, Wes, I like one of the things you said, maybe share a little bit about your mindset. I'm taking over the question. (laughs) Share a little bit about your mindset when you came in the game, because I think besides, you know, having the bills to pay, you have said in the past that you would go into a meeting with so much information and so much preparedness that there well, really couldn't be a reason that a client would say no. Yeah, so I, I did, I developed this mindset um, that, uh, <laughs> this is gonna sound bad. The only reason you wouldn't work with me is because I'm black. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is, um, so I got my CFP in 2010, which is about as fast as you can do it with uh, the three years of experience in the industry, my internship counted. I, t- I started taking the test as soon as I graduated and charted a path to do it within a year and a half and then start sitting for the exam. And um, I used to, you know, Anton and I would joke around this of like the obstacles that would immediately, whether real or in our own head, which makes it real because mm-hmm. uh, it was <laughs> real to us, um, the obstacles that we may be facing before we get, when we're on the phone, before we get in the door and once we get in the room. So, uh, my determination was I'm going to be the smartest person in the room at this. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to be smarter than the doctors. I'm not going to be smarter than the lawyers. I'm not going to be smarter than the engineers. But when it comes to math and when it comes to planning, I'm going to be the smartest in the room. At the same time, I'm going to have empathy in a bedside manner and all of that because that's authentic and it's real. Mm-hmm. And I don't have to articulate that. It's going to come across, but I am going to know more. There's not going to be you know, objections to what I'm saying. So we used to call them no-brainer solutions. Um, and uh, we would get together, uh, you know, we would go through these, here's here's my case study. Tell me why you would say no to this. So I, not to, so that I can overcome an objection, so to make sure I'm thinking about everything the right way. Mm-hmm. Then I'm like, okay, I haven't thought about that. Let me go back and maybe I need to adjust my solution. Um, and what's funny is it worked. Uh, and so we would get a lot of yeses, you know, even in 2010 or 2011, I would have really, really high prospect to client conversions. And once I took the fact finder and if there was, you know, a, a client to be had, I mean, it was like 90 something percent. Um, but it, it was like, I'm, I'm going to overcome every objection before I know I'm going to know it. And I'm, it's going to be so well thought out that the answer should be yes. Unless fill in the blank. <laughs> you know? And we still we still took a lot of no's though. We still uh, you know, someone at, at Northwestern said this, and I've heard Wes regurgitate it. It's like that fireplace over there, I took a hundred no's for that. This house right here, I took X amount of no's for that. So yeah, that's you, you keep coming back to the takes a village. If you're handling rejection alone, it's really, really challenging. If you're two or three compatriots, just took two or three no's as well, and you all go to the bar and drink, or you all say, you know what, F it, I'm going to hop on the phone, make 10 more calls tonight before I go home. I mean, you're pushing through, you're pushing through together. It makes those rejections a lot easier to sustain. Mm-hmm. So what, what came to mind for me, you know, Wes, as you were sharing that in particular, is I think about this idea of um, I, I thought about self-awareness and, and I think I see that often in a lot of high performers. I, I think about self-awareness because as you're describing, you know, essentially you had the awareness to, to understand, to predict and to project any possible objection that might come your way, right? Like I, I think um, to have the ability to assess your situation in, in a 360 and take a look at what are all the obstacles and problems and objections that might stop me from accomplishing my goal 
and then to to put in the preparation and the hard work to prepare for all of those so that as you said you know there's there's no reason why you wouldn't become my client uh, yeah. I, I just I, I think about self-awareness there I think it takes a lot of it to to have that skill set you're spot on um, you know I don't I don't know if I could add much more to that but you do have to look in the mirror you do have to um, say you know where are my shortcomings where am I good at you know what's interesting uh, uh, as you were saying that, I was thinking it's a lot easier to do it back then than it is now um, from a from a growth perspective, uh, because you have to right now you have to fight off complacency, which can be completely rationalized versus then it's like, I, I got to eat, you know, and if I if I don't <laughs> have that self-awareness, if I don't have that change, that catalyst, I'm not going to be able to have food on my table. But when I think about us getting from, you know, just under 200 million to a billion, there's marketing, there's other things that I have, we have to be doing, like the change. And I'm like, ah, I kind of want to resist that. That's not really how my mind works. Yep. Um, and I, yep. I have to, in order to do that, though, I've got to overcome that stuff quickly. Um, and so as you were saying, I was like, yeah, it was much easier back in the day. Now I'm like, you can be like, ah, I'm fine. It's growing. <laughs> you know? sure. Well, sure. so then how... How at this stage, how do you overcome those things when, you, when it is different, when, when you aren't scrapping to, to put food on the table or pay your rent, then, then how are you overcoming these things? What's still driving you to reach this big vision you have? You make the bills bigger. <laughs> no, no, no. You I'm stay just strapped. <laughs> yeah. Always, always. No, no, no. In, in, in reality, and, and maybe Wes has a different answer. Um, I always saw myself being successful, but it's different when you get here to whatever that level of success, maybe it's 2020 and I've, I've, I've attained what my 2015 success looked like. Um, but now that you know what's possible, to me, that's the driver. Wes has got two kids, I got one and one on the way. It's like, how, how big can we make this thing, right? So yeah. uh, uh, it's, a big part of it too is setting an example because in our community, not enough people are successful because not enough people take risks. And I grew up in kind of a, not scarcity mentality, but um, risk averse household. Like keep it close to the vest, don't talk about things. Frankly, I went to counseling to talk about, and it, it taught me a lot about um, internal locus of, of control and external locus of control. It's like, no, oh, there's luck but then there's a lot of hard work and things that you can control yourself. I pulled out my phone a second ago because I wanted to, these are the conversations I have with my buddies. If you guys were on your deathbed and you could give Amara, my daughter, one piece of advice, what would it be? And then we're answering these questions. Don't play scared, take calculated risks. The world won't wait. Uh, if you go slow, you might make a mistake anyway. Uh, a buddy of mine said, always be brave, be confident, take risks. Um, my wife said, uh, if you can dream it, if you believe in it, if you work hard for it, anything is possible. And these are conversations that we're having that frankly, I've never, never had before. So I don't even know where I was going with that, but I wanted to, to touch on that. Piece. It was a good point though. It was a good point. It was so off topic. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> so the, you know, the other yeah. thing, go ahead, Wes. The, I will say that it, it, it is interesting now because, um, Growth, and this this may sound crazy, but growth feels like an obligation now more than ever um, for so many reasons that the decisions, you know, when you, when the, when the vision is big and when the, the why, even more than the vision, but when the why is big, the decisions become a lot easier. And so when I say it feels obligatory, uh, there's a lot of reasons why it feels like an obligation is who we are in the industry needs to be bigger. It needs to be, there needs to be casts on it so people can see it. Um, the, uh, the people that we hire, so can we make a workforce that reflects the actual city that we live in? We have, uh, you know, two black people, we have two women, we have a 55 year old man, we have generational diversity, sex diversity, race diversity, that's, that's insane. It, I know it's only five people, but as we continue to grow, we will hire people that look like the city that we live in. Mm -hmm. That needs to grow. The fact that 
uh, women and minorities make up you know, 1% of the, 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 the industry, but a third of the top performers, we have the ability to change that. We are changing that actively. So mm -hmm. it feels like an obligation because of what we are. And to your point, to my point about the things that I need to change and the things that we need to get over right now, it's just about how do we do it? Because it doesn't feel like an option anymore. We have to do this. And it, it just makes it so easy. Um, not, not saying it's not going to be a challenge to do it and hire the right people and, 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 you know, manage that, but it's not like, should we, or should we not? It's how. Yep. 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 That, that idea of, of creating, uh, creating a team of financial professionals that reflects the communities we serve is something that, that we believe in very heavily at Mass Mutual Great Lakes as well, you know, with starting mm -hmm. the collective financial group and, and, and all women's financial group. Um, how, how do firms like ours, how do firms like yours, how do we go about creating uh, those teams in an environment where you talk about the 1% in this industry of, of women, of minorities, how do we create environments that, that can help us achieve that vision of truly creating teams that are reflective of our communities because it's not the case right now? You, I mean, you have to be very, very intentional for one. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to have, and you have to have more than one. And that goes back to my conversation about not being, not feeling like I'm alone. It can't be a token project, um, but you, it, it is going to be so challenging. Uh, and yeah. you have to embrace that going into it. You have to embrace it going into it, uh, but you have to be intentional. You have to, it can't be, you know, it has to be real. It has to be, we want this because of the value that women provide. Jolene looks at things differently. She looks at things um, so, sometimes more systematically than I do. She keeps us in check. That's valuable. That's firm value. Jim, a little bit older, uh, looks at things differently, processes things differently, enables us to be better bosses and managers because we're looking at different personalities. Like we, you have to authentically believe that there's a value to different people, races, genders, and identities. Um, and, and, and you have to keep going until you get there. You can't just, you know, we struck out. It, that's not an answer. Uh, we got to really, really be intentional about creating this. Love it. Um, one of the, the things that I, I wanted to ask you both about. So, you know, one of the, one of the core things that Manny will often talk about and, and he wanted me to ask about is this idea of, of intentional hustle. Right. And, um, the, the idea behind, he always places this qualifier of intentional in front of the word hustle, because I think uh, often hustle can be portrayed as, uh, can be like really glamorous and yeah. this thing that, you know, just put in work, 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 but, but the hustle needs to be intentional. And sometimes I think you can actually reverse engineer and, and the hustle that needs to be intentional can look a variety of different ways and in, in be presented in different forms. One of the things that you both talked about, especially in this last year, is you talked about uh, taking some sort of mental health breaks, right? Talk to me a little bit about that and how that fits into this intentional hustle picture, because I think it's often something, especially on the mental side of it, when we think about hustle, you really don't hear a conversation around that. It's these two guys are building this team. They're incredibly successful. They must just work all the time, work hard, hard, hard. But, uh, Tell me more about, about those, those mental health breaks and how, how that is still part of the intentional hustle picture for you. Wes, you take that. Wes is uh, taking two months off this, or two weeks off this month. So he knows that deeply. <laughs> You're such an idiot. Well, you know, this, um, so we started a business in December. Uh, we had, you know, the first two months were amazing. Um, and then everything fell apart. And I don't mean our business fell apart, but uh, the pandemic, um, the, the market, you know, we had by the end of, so we had about 140 million that we were transitioning with. And by the end of uh, February, so the first two months, we had about 115 of it. So we were like 80% the way there. And by March 23rd, uh, it was at 89 million. And I had on March 12th, uh, I was supposed to go on a, it was my birthday that weekend and it was like a three month celebration with my wife. Uh, and, and we were on the fence because states were starting to shut down. Um, I woke up that morning 
and the market was down at 3,000 points. And I was like, looks like we ain't going anywhere. So I hightailed it in the office, the whole team met here. And we were like, what are we going to do so that clients don't go to cash? We're not going to do nothing. We're not, and we're also not going to sell out. So we started thinking about, can we do Roth conversions for the assets that have been most hit, knowing that they'll come back? Uh, can we tax loss harvest into areas that we want to get into? So staying invested and giving them a write-off. So we started thinking about all the strategic things that we can do to make the most of this situation. Fast forward a week later, states shut down. We move our families east of the mountain where we have houses and we're isolated. Um, and you're just working, working nonstop. And you're working more, by the way, because oh, yeah. it's just the computer's right there. <clears throat> and so I can answer an email at 10 because I'm like, ah, it's right there. Versus I went six or seven years without even bringing my laptop home after work. Um, and then the social justice things happen. Uh, and so now we're in June and you're like, I'm fucking spent. Uh, and you're like, we, you need to take care of yourself. You need to, I, right now I, in, in this state of life, I, and I joke with the team, it is all out surrender to take care of your mental health. I bought saunas. Sure. I've done, you know, you do whatever you have to do to get through this period. I tell clients, we can look back next year and figure out if it was a good decision, but you have to do whatever yeah. you have to do. And so with Jolene, who's been with us for so long, I think it was like somewhere in June, it was like, you were taking a couple of days off right now. Mm -hmm. You were going to take a break and, and that will allow mm -hmm. us to come back and hit it harder. But we can't just be continually getting worn down because this is a season that we've never seen before. The, the, the yep. three things that were happening, we've never seen that before. Um, and you have got to take, if you're not healthy, we're not healthy. Um, and so, you know, that's going to be a theme that sticks with us. If you work, if you're working too much, you need to take some time. You need to take a day off. This is, this is the whole self that we need. Yeah. We almost have to recreate what, uh, the mental break looked like because we weren't able to do the concerts and take the trips. Uh, my honeymoon was delayed by a couple of years and we were going to go first class do the whole thing, uh, down in Mexico for Labor Day weekend canceled. Um, so we just had to get more creative and to your point earlier, intentional about what we were doing to, to maintain our mental health. Um, whether that's working from home, like Wes said, whether that's getting a sauna, whether it was, um, we downloaded some, some apps to help us meditate and so on. Uh, this year has been so crazy for everyone, but, you know, specific to us, to leave and start our firm December 9th, <clears throat> have immediate success, which we were confident in because success meant keeping our clients uh, with the white glove service that they'd had their whole time with us and bringing those assets over. And three months in, you have the pandemic and consequent market crash. And then they, you're sitting at home and every other week, every three weeks, you're seeing that somebody that looks like you is getting killed. And this is stuff that we've been seeing and talking about for years. I remember, God, it had to be six years ago, uh, Wes bought some um, I'm Tamir Rice sweatshirts. And um, we sat and commiserated and cried when Trayvon Martin was killed. And it's just, <clears throat> anyway, the, 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 the point is we simply shifted how we thought about our mental health breaks and became more intentional about it and started talking about it more to the team and started being transparent about the fact that everyone in the, uh, on the team was going to counseling, mm -hmm. right? So it made other people more comfortable with, with uh, having this counseling conversations and uh, a couple of team members we had at the time or one one team member we had at the time hadn't gone to counseling and she started started doing it. Yeah, at our peak, we were four for four, <laughs> which yep. is awesome. Yep. But it's it's refreshing to, to hear people like the two of you preach about the mental health part of it and how, again, from that intentional hustle standpoint, how it helps you come back stronger and actually helps propel you forward even further than if you didn't take those breaks. I just don't <clears> think it's a conversation <throat> that a lot of people are having especially uh, when you're really focused on high performance and you're focused on a big vision and big goals. I just don't think it's part of the equation that's talked about enough. Well, there's a couple of things there. Um, so uh, I won't, I won't get too deep into this, but when I was 11, my brother passed away. Um, and, uh, and then nine, like three weeks later, we were 
uh, going down to LA for the funeral and his girlfriend found out she was pregnant. Um, and I, and so that was 11. And then I had some things happen in college. Um, and, uh, and so I really, I started taking therapy like early on in my life. Uh, and I couldn't understand at the time. So this is like maybe 2007, 2008. I couldn't understand why there was such a stigma around it. Um, I was like, wait, to go talk to another human about your issues seems like the most normal thing to do. And yet, it's even in, especially in the black community, my parents, after my brother died, was never went to therapy. It was just like mind boggling. Um, it's mind boggling now, it wasn't mind boggling back then, but you mm -hmm. know, suppressing things and, that, and, and keep moving forward and um, side crazy tangent, at the same time, around the, within a couple of years, I had two cousins die also, both of them were murdered. And so it's actually, trauma is so normal in our culture that it's not even something that you think about or blink, you know, it's just, it's just something that we've dealt with. So I started taking it early on because I have an older sister and she's amazing. And she was like, you need to talk to someone. Um, and so it's never been a stigma for me like it has been for others. And also in our country, we don't talk about mental health enough. I mean, we, they talk about homelessness and drug, they don't talk about mental health and why we're doing nothing about it. So it has been normal and now it's normal for our team. Um, but around the breaks, <laughs> it's a funny story. I used to go on vacations by myself. Um, and so again, same managing director, same team. I, what we noticed that it was easy, it was so easy for me to sprint to something if I had a, an end date. So in 2009, uh, I would work hard for three months, but they would make me schedule my vacations in advance. So I'd, I'd book a trip to Mexico at the end of March so I could run for three months knowing that I had a, a carrot at the end of it. And then the next three months, I'd book a trip to Napa. Uh, I, and this was no girlfriend. I would just go by myself. Uh, and it, it, was, it was a switch of like, when, you're, when, when there's no end in sight, it makes the task so much harder. But right. when there's something to look forward to, it makes it easier. It's like, okay, I just got another week. I just got another two weeks. Let me grind through, let me reset, and let me come back and do it again. And that's that intentional hustle that Manny's talking about. Mm -hmm. I think that's powerful. I, I think it's powerful. And that, that makes us uh, add, add me to your team and we're three for three here. I'm, I'm yeah. someone that uh, uh, I go to counseling. I see a therapist on a weekly basis. And look, I mean, I just think it for exactly the reasons that you said to, to unpack different things personally and professionally. Uh, I think the within the last year or so that I've been doing it, um, the improvements that I've seen uh, and, and especially, it, and it translates professionally. It's not just a personal mm -hmm. thing. I can see yeah. in my professional life, the things that I'm accomplishing and achieving um, because I'm taking time to really, to take breaks and to process and to, to understand things and understand myself deeper. Now I can apply those things in all areas of my life. And I think that that in turn makes us higher performers. It makes Absolutely. us so much better. The mind is a muscle that needs to consistently be worked on. I mean, you've heard about, You've heard us talk about it so many times on this podcast from vision casting and breaking the barriers, the, the mental barriers, the ceilings in your mind um, to giving it the recovery and the nurturing and the massage that it needs. You need to consistently work on your mind. It, it is uh, the most powerful thing and it can also be the most limiting thing. Yeah. One of the things uh, we used to say, uh, another Newman school of thought was I am dot, dot, dot. And then you, you, you create whatever is at the end of that. Because those are the, most, the two most powerful words when it comes to, to, to working that mind out, exercising yeah. your mind. <clears throat> yeah, 100%. As we, uh, as, as we wrap up here, I've, I've got two last questions. But my first one would be, you know, our, a lot of our audience is college students, young professionals. Um, I'm curious what, what each of your, your piece of advice would be, especially to, um, you know, whether it's, a, whether it's minority communities or whether it's someone who wants to, to take that path that hasn't been paved yet or hasn't been traveled. They've got this vision, they have this idea of what they want to accomplish, but whether it's their own limiting beliefs or it's the people around them or it's, it's the, the community they exist in, you know, they're, they're, they might not pursue it. 
-hmm. what would be your, your advice, your words of encouragement, whatever you would say to someone in that situation, who's, who's considering doing something and wants to pursue that vision. That's just different. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Antoine mentioned his background of being a little bit more conservative, uh, just, the, just the way that he grew up. Risks and things like that were never actually talked about in my household. However, uh, my parents were always a, we believe in you, son. That was their sort of the, the words of affirmation they used to give in to me. We, we believe in you. Um, and, uh, and it enabled me to take, take risks and feel comfortable. And I remember... Um, you know, Newman used to ask me, Ben used to ask me on coaching calls, what's the worst that could happen? No, no, no. He used to ask me, what's the worst thing that happens that's happened to you? And I was like, well, my brother passed away. And he, he was like, well, what could be worse than that? And it had me thinking nothing, nothing. So at the end of the day, I'm going to take this risk and I'm going to be okay. Because mm -hmm. it ain't going to be, it's not going to be the depths of the hell that I was in. Um, and when you think about things like that, like, well, what's the worst that can happen? L literally, what's the worst that can happen? And it's not that? Okay. And if you fail, so what? So what? So many of the billionaires and athletes, and they, it's all because you failed. Yep. Um, and so I would tell, you know, let's live mm -hmm. a life worth living. If you want to do something, if you want to pursue your passion and it's a risk, I would say, take it. Take it. Don't do it for doing its sake though. You have to really know yourself and be passionate around it so that your why, your belief is so deep that nothing can stop you. But then if that's the case, then take that risk. It's worth it. Yep. You know, my add to that would be very simple. I go back to my young self. It was time alone, no cell phone, no anything, a pen and a pad, writing down those, those big scary visions, um, knowing that you have to take calculated risk to get there and finding an accountability partner at the end of the day. You can write down all the visions that you want. And if, if you don't hit it and it's only to yourself, it's, it's, it's who cares? Ah, I right. messed up. I'll do it again next year. But if you put the proverbial fan in the stands or you have an accountability partner that's pushing for something and, and it's not going to be uh, timid about calling you out, the odds of you getting to wherever that vision is uh, are, are, are much higher. So simple, actionable steps that you can take at a young age. Look, man, when I got in this industry, I was 24. I had what we call the silver bullet, which was a Nissan Sentra with a freaking Bondo door uh, because I'd gotten hit by, by a semi truck and I took the insurance money and I went and I bought Patron shots and seven jeans. <laughs> and Wes had a 91 Honda Civic, white knight. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, like, like I said, it took a village, it took belief in self and others showing that they believed in you and several accountability partners to get to even where we were three years ago to build the confidence to say, you know what? We wanna build something that's greater than us. And that's when the, 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 the idea of formalizing Burns Toussaint and Associates came to mind. And then it takes a couple seminal moments, uh, whatever that may mean for you, for us, it was, Nipsey getting killed, it really, really solidified what we wanted in our minds. And we, that's when we first thought about buying a commercial space to move our office into. And then it just develops from yeah. there. It's something we're still working on. 100%. Yeah. I mean, I think, it's, I think it's always a work in progress, right? But, but I think I, uh, I, I'm extremely grateful for this conversation. And I think, you know, your, the insight that, two, that the two of you can provide in your story uh, can provide a lot of inspiration to to that younger generation, to younger people who want to follow a similar path, because I think you're, you're continuing to prove that, that it can be done, right? And that's what you talked about. What a powerful thing. Uh, to wrap us up, tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, anything that you're most excited about right now for Burns Toussaint. And if people want to connect with uh, your firm and with the two of you, how can they do that? Go ahead, AT. Um, what I'm most excited about with Burns Toussaint frankly, is that I know we haven't even scratched the surface. We have, in the last year, December 9th is our anniversary. Uh, we've come out on the other end of such a tumultuous year with great success. Like Wes said, we had 140 million to bring over. We crested 170 million as of last night. Who knows what the market's doing today. But 
we always say to one another, we haven't even scratched the surface. We're just learning what's possible in this new independent space. So I'm excited about hitting a billion dollars and I think we can do it in six yeah. years. I'm excited about our next hires. I'm excited about for the first time in our 13, 14 year careers, truly understanding that we have a business and we are CEOs, executives and co-founders in that, in that business and knowing how big we can become. Yeah, I echo that. I mean, we're, we're, we're just scratching the surface and I don't know if this is, you know, an acute window of time or if this is, you know, a, a so, sort of a social justice change that we're, go, that's going to be lasting. Um, but I'm, I'm excited if it is, if it's lasting change, because, um, you know, we would be a benefactor of that, but also we'd be, um, you know, a recipient of that gift, or we would be a grantor of that gift to the next generation. So when you think about highlighting women, you know, minority firms and what we've actually performed in the industry, um, if this is lasting change, I think the future is ours and I think it's bright. Um, and what we can do with those resources, like we talked about earlier, I think we can, I think we can create change. So, um, uh, you know, as far as connecting with us, obviously we're both on LinkedIn. Um, our emails are, you know, Wesley and Antoine, Wesley at Burns Tucson, Antoine at Burns Tucson.com. Um, I have taken uh, several um, calls or Zooms or whatever on people that just want to know more. Uh, and so since we've moved the, in some media that's been published, people are actually interested about getting into financial services. And I welcome those conversations uh, because it's bigger than just, you know, us. It's, it's what, what we can do for the next gen. Yep. Awesome. Gentlemen, thanks so much for investing some time with me this morning. Uh, again, uh, fantastic conversation. I look forward to sharing it uh, in the coming weeks. Thanks for your time. Absolutely, Absolutely. Chad. Appreciate Thank you, you Chad. Take care, All right, talk to you later. Take care now. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. This episode of Vision, Hustle, Grit, and Gratitude is brought to you by our Michigan-based firm, Mass Mutual Great Lakes. Growing up as one of four boys outside of the city of Chicago, my brothers and I enjoyed an unbelievable abundance of faith, family, fitness, becoming ferocious competitors as young men, and gratitude for what it means to live in a free country. The one thing we lacked a little bit of on a consistent basis was financial resources. And lacking that level of financial security and stability and success prevented us from having one very special thing throughout our lives, which was consistently having the power of choice. Becoming a professional in our industry means that you have the opportunity to architect your clients, your friends, your family's financial household, their plan to create financial well-being and success throughout their lives. This alone empowers people to have the power of choice for themselves, their families, and the businesses that they serve and represent. Our firm is based in Southeast Michigan, and we're always looking to bring on great people. Great people making great decisions consistently delivers great outcomes. If you'd like to learn more about career opportunities with our firm, visit greatlakes.massmutual.com backslash careers to start a conversation with our team today. We look forward to hearing from you.